Welcome to the Heme Consults Orientation Series. This is video number 24. And today I'm talking about curbside consults. I love curbsides. They keep you from doing work, except that they don't. <laughs> they're like, it's just a curbside. And they call you back 20 minutes later and they're like, it's just a curbside. And the next day they're like, but, but you know, could you look again? Uh, not a curbside. <laughs> So anyway, I want to I want to talk to you today about how to think about curbsides. Okay. Now, a curbside consult assumes there's no big deal here. It's just a simple question. But I want to say if they're calling you, it is not a simple question. Usually not. So, for example, if they call and say, "Hey, what's the dose of anoxaparin for a patient who needs therapy against anticoagulation?" Okay, that's a curbside. That could be a curbside, but it's also the kind of thing that you could just Google. <laughs> <laughs> so most of the time the calls that come in are not like that i had an experience once where somebody called and said well this patient's about to get a stem cell transplant and we want to know if their platelet falls below 50 if they should get a transfusion or we should just set their transfusion goal at 10 and i thought i was like why would you call me and ask me about platelet transfusion you guys do transplant all the time and so we decided that wasn't going to be a curbside consult and we went to see the patient and it turns out the patient has hemophilia a that's a big deal. I want to know about that before the patient goes to transplant. And I don't want to just assume that we can just transfuse the platelet go to 50. I really do want to think about the hemophilia A. So that's the danger of a curbside consult because you don't have all the information and people may not know what they don't know. So a curbside question may assume that the consult is not a big deal, but you get to decide. And that's point number two is that you are the one responsible for determining the appropriateness of the curbside, not the team. So the team can call and say, oh, this is just a simple curbside. And you listen and you're like, oh, that sounds like something more involved. So really the decision lies with you, not with the team to make the decision. And most of the time, I don't know if you should do a curbside consult. This is my bias showing. All right, let's talk a little bit more. When is it not a curbside consult? It's not a curbside consult if you have to look up the patient in the chart to answer the question. If you're navigating through the chart, trying to figure out when was the last transfusion, it's not a curbside anymore. It's actually a consult question that should be thoughtfully addressed because a curbside consult, again, assumes that it's a simple question that anybody potentially can answer. And if anybody could answer it, then why are you answering it? But usually there's more to the question than meets the eye, but you don't know until you go digging. And so if you're starting to dig already, it's a sign that it's not a curbside consult. It's also not a curbside consult if it takes more than a few minutes to answer the question. So you're scrolling through the record. You're like, oh, what's the proper dosing for? You're calling pharmacy, not a curbside consult. And the other thing is if they're going to use that decision, that curbside to support a medical decision, uh, not a curbside question. So they're calling you. They're like, should we give the patient anoxaparin or picks a van. <laughs> oh, I'm only calling because of the renal function. That's a curbside consult because they're going to base a medical decision off of your recommendation. It really should be a patient who's formally seen and your formal recommendation in the chart. Okay. Now, what can you do if you don't accept a curbside? Okay. There are different things you can do. So for example, in, in the example I gave about if they're calling about the dose of Novinox to start a patient on anticoagulation, you could say, oh, I don't have that off the top of my head. Why don't you call pharmacy? Or they're calling and saying, well, this patient with sickle cell needs an appointment. We don't need him to be seen. We just need the appointment. You can say, oh, let me connect you with the sickle cell rounding service. Hey, here, this is their number. So think about how you can delegate things. And sometimes you delegate back to the team. They'll say, hey, can you look at the blood film? No, we don't want to tell you anything about the patient. Just look at the blood film. Say, oh, pathology might be able to help you with that. Why don't you give them a call and see if they'll help you with that? So those are the kinds of things that you want to think about rather than accepting a curbside and taking ownership and taking responsibility for something that you actually haven't had a chance to really look at carefully. A curbside tends to ignore the rules of patient care <laughs> and also the value of your time. So really in order to make an informed decision about a patient, usually talking to the patient is recommended and doing a thorough physical exam and a curbside consult kind of bypasses all of that. And you're still invested in doing a lot of work and people are basing their decisions off of what you're saying. So it doesn't really recognize the value of your time because it doesn't compensate you for it. So you do a curbside, you don't see the patient, 
You don't write a note. It doesn't generate a bill. So that's time that's uncompensated. And as a fellow, you might be like, I don't care. Most of my time is uncompensated anyway. But it's an important habit to think about the fact that the business of medicine is the business of medicine and that when service is rendered, then you generate a bill that is that, that allows people to say thank you for the services provided. And when you don't do that, it's not just about the business, but it's about the fact that the patient is actually not getting the maximum care because you're kind of not doing a great job <laughs> by not seeing the patient and really appropriately documenting your recommendation. Okay. All right. It is important, no matter what you decide, curbside or no curbside, to document your thought in the chart. Because usually from a curbside consult, people are making they're making medical decisions and you want to make your own notation in the chart so that people know what you were thinking at the time of the recommendation. So always make a note in the chart. If you don't see the patient, make it a brief note, not a long note, but a brief note. All right. My last point is that if you are in doubt, is this a curbside? Or does, is it not a curbside? Just see the patient. Sometimes I'll show up for rounds at three and someone's like, I wasn't sure if this one should be seen. I'm like, why didn't you just see the patient? <laughs> when in doubt, see the patient. All right, so this week, decide in advance, what are your criteria for an acceptable curbside or not? Don't make the decision on the fly. Have a list. It's like, okay, this is when it makes sense for this to be a curbside versus not. And when the consult question comes in, answer, does it meet the criteria of the list or not? Remember, what you don't know is critical. And sometimes the curbside consult may, it may take advantage of the fact that you're, you have a knowledge gap. And so you don't recognize that there's more to the question than meets the eye. All right, enough about curbside consults. I'll talk to you on the next video.